In this video, we're going to do a Q&A where we're going to go over some questions that I've been asked in private message and on comments. Also, I've collated some that I think that would be helpful for people who are watching the video. So if you want to know more about property investing and get a deeper understanding of what things we are doing at the moment and that's being successful for our investments, then keep watching this video. So the first question is, what is your investment strategy? Now, I would look at this a bit differently. I would not look at specifically just the investment because really what we do is we assess each of the properties and figure out what strategy would be best for that specific property. What I would look at is what are the types of strategies that we're implementing. Now, for me, a lot of the stuff we do is buy, refurbish, rent, refinance. And the reason for that is but we want to recycle our money as quickly as possible. Now, what do I mean by recycle? cycle our money. So for example, if I was to do the normal buy to lead vanilla strategy and I was putting 25% down on a mortgage and that was my deposit and then I was just paying the rest which is you know the legal stamp and maybe a bit of renovation. Well my money is locked up for a long period of time. Now when you lock it up for a long period of time, say maybe two years, then it's going to take me all that time before I'm going to get the money back out. Whereas if I employ a buy refurbish rent refinance strategy then what I'm able to do is wait up to the six month marker and you can you can refinance before that it's just a guideline but in most cases the lender will look at it even harsher so and it also limits the pool of people that you can go to in order who you're going to get that remortgage with so I look at it this way if I'm going to do it I'm going to wait six months I'm going to buy in cash I'm going to wait six months and I'm going to take my money back out after that six month period what my goal is to do is to increase the value of the property so I'm coming in and renovating the property or I've already bought it below market value and I don't really need to do that much but my idea is that I'm going to push the value up and I'm going to pull out 75% of that money back out and in a lot of the cases that we're doing personally we've been able to pull the majority of the money out but realistically you can't do that on every property and we do spend a hell of a lot on advertising to get direct to vendor leads and we've done it so that we can get leads for our clients so we're also getting leads and sourcing for our clients so it makes sense for us to do that whereas in most cases, people are going to leave in more money, I would say up to about £20,000 in the deal. And that can still be a, a re really good return. Um, personally, our criteria for that is making sure that we can pull out 20% ROCE, return on capital employed. Um, that's a minimum requirement for our investments in most cases, unless I see some other nuances as to the reason why I'm going to invest in it. Maybe I'll look at it a bit differently, but ultimately buy, refurbish, refinance, rent is going to be our strategy mainly. We also source properties, which I've uh, basically talked about a bit, where we source properties for other investors and we do that either if they're more sophisticated investors and they've done it before most cases those people are coming in and we're buying the properties on their behalf and they're giving us a fee as a result of that or we're getting people a lot of the people that i actually work with just lend us the money to purchase the properties and we'll give them a fixed interest rate return and the reason for that is most of the people can't have well don't really have the time they have high paying jobs or they're retired and they just want the money to work for them they've got a security backed asset so what we're giving them is a ch1 charge in some cases um, that allows them to have the security and then they know that it's going to be there the property is a secured asset uh, as opposed to if we were investing in stocks on their behalf and then they would have no security because of the company tanks then that's it the money's gone Really, that's not really going to happen with property, even if it drops by 15%, which it did in the 2008 crash. That doesn't mean that that's going to be the thing that's going to happen. So you've got a lot of the money secured, at least in that regard. And we also give personal guarantees as well to make sure that we're paying the money back to those investors. So the next question is, do you think there's going to be a crash? In my personal opinion, well, there's always a crash in, 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 at, at some point. If you look at the 18-year property cycle, there's a crash that's going to happen at some point. But the problem is you can never time the market. A lot of the cases, if you see some people trying to predict it, every time they seem to get it wrong or they get it right by a stroke of luck, not by pure genius. And that's not something that really happens. So from my personal opinion, what I think at the moment, there's going to be a period where we're going to see growth. Um, and I think even before the 2008 crash, you had four solid years of growth before there was a crash. So if you think about that, 
we've only had about two years of growth right right at the moment so i think this is going to go on for another couple of years at least before we see another crash um but who can tell really i mean you can roughly tell where you are in the 18 year property cycle by assessing that um but you're never going to get 100 percent and that's what i would say is that you would we're at a phase where i don't think that it's going to fall off a cliff right now but I do think that it's going to go down in the next few years, maybe come down to what we consider, you know, more reasonable prices. Um, but it's good news. It's not only bad news when you've got a property crash. There are good news. If you've got the capital there to deploy into properties that are going to be 100% below the market value that it was, um, you can pick up some really good deals and there's going to be lots of things like happening. But there's also lots of bad things happening to people like unemployment and all those other things. That's going to be the signs of that, but it is a good opportunity if you're picking up, the, you know, basically bargain prices and those properties, if you're buying those and they're going up in value after that period in the recovery phase, then you were definitely winning. And this is why so many millionaires were made in recessions and times of hardship, even through the pandemic as well. This is why these kind of things happen. A lot of losers, a lot of winners. Um, and unfortunately, that's just how things work. But yeah, I do think that there will be a crash eventually, but not anytime soon. Yeah, at least a couple of years. I hope you are enjoying the video so far. If you are getting value from this, please hit like and subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. It, it helps more than you will ever know. Believe me, it helps more people see it. If you engage with us, then it tells the YouTube algorithm to show it to more people and it can help more people like yourself invest in property if you've got any questions please do put them below because i'll be able to answer them there okay so the next question is how did i get started in property that's that's a funny one so we had a marketing well we still have a marketing agency so then my background is marketing and advertising so what we were doing was we were doing advertising for uh, plastic surgeons in la and new york so plastic surgeons bed spas in la and new york may primarily helping them with instagram that was kind of our you know, day job, as you would say. Uh, we spent the majority of time doing that and we were building up good profits in the company. So we needed to put money into somewhere and I wanna look at long-term assets. Although I think obviously um, social media and everything is not going anywhere. What I think is that if we're looking at it, specifically we're looking at Instagram, you've always got to be moving with trends. And at some point I want to retire and I don't want to have to think about all of these other aspects of it. So I want to, you know, there's going to be things like algorithm changes and all this kind of stuff. So I wanted to make sure that I hedge my bets and invest in an asset class where things are not really going to change because people need roofs over their head. So ultimately that's why I chose to invest in property. And I knew that it was a good uh, investment source that's more stable. And because of the area that I live in, particularly, uh, in South Wales, I know that that's a key investment area for a lot of people. And for that reason, we looked at investing in property for the long term, and it was definitely a long term option for us. The next question is, who did I learn from? So I would say I learned from a lot of people, a lot of different resources. Another one was definitely YouTube right here. That was a really important part of my investment journey. But ultimately, what got me started in it was just about friends discussing investment and property investment. And then I had this wonderful idea to create a marketing channel for property investing, which was one of the things that really led me into this journey. I had an idea for building a platform, which I still do at some point. Um, we will work on that, but I've got stuck into investing in property itself and just making that work. Um, but our whole idea is to build a community, build a platform, and this is why I'm on YouTube, is to help other people and build a resource for other people to use, and that's ultimately the goal. But I got into it because of that, and I got to talk to a um, investor who was then became a good friend, so I was in the NatWest Accelerator, um, where it was for new starts businesses, and I was with my marketing agency, I was there, so for high growth, and what I was th did then was ask for a bit of help. I wanted to talk to somebody within property investment. And then, I, well, not a friend at the time, but somebody was there, was a property investor with a quite large portfolio. And they were basically living the dream, um, living the life that I wanted to live anyway. And they'd already, you know, sussed it out. They've invested quite a substantial amount in property and they were earning, you know, a multi six figure salary as a result of it. 
and I got to learn off them. They, they took the time to have a chat with me, understand a bit more about property, uh, and they really gave me the confidence and the motivation to start investing in property, and they seen that I had the ambition to do that. And ever since, we have become really good friends, and what we've done is, you know, grab coffees, grab food, go out, you know, that kind of thing, um, to events, expos, all this kind of stuff. So we started building a good relationship, and then they, sort of turned into my mentor not as a purposeful thing to turn into my mentor i just want some information on property investing um more the market itself and it then inspired me to really get into investing for myself and as things changed to the pandemic um we decided to get into the investment side of things and they've been there the whole time and given me some really insightful things um, into my journey but very very useful and that is probably the reason why I got into investing in the first place is because having good people around me that told me about what they were achieving in property and I thought I want to do exactly the same as well and I thought it would be a million miles away at the time but really understanding it and having good people around me like I said is definitely the reason why we got into investing in property. So the next question is how did I choose my area? Now I would say the reason I choose my area because partly a bit of laziness, um, but because it's on my doorstep, I know that if you can invest on your doorstep, there's no better option to be honest. Um, but the reason for that is because of the prices. Now where we live, it's not too much for properties. If I was in London, this would be a completely different chat and I would say invest outside of London. But you can make a success of investing in London, um, but it just means that you're going to need more capital in most cases. And for us, we wanted to purchase properties in our local area that we could deal with it. And we could we, we really had an idea of buying multiple properties at a time. So that was a crucial part of it is to buy a lot of properties at the same time, um, accelerating our growth of our, our portfolio. And the way to do that was that we had our own build teams that we could go around and we could do multiple projects at a time. And that was kind of the key thing that we wanted to do and having them in the area with people we knew and people we trusted and having a really good team around us was so crucial in order to do that, that investing in our area was the best choice for us. And that was South Wales. And particularly we look at the capital growth and the yield in the area and um, so i'm looking at not only the yield whereas i could go into areas that are not as good i also look to invest close to the m4 particularly for that reason because i know that that those links to the m4 um, were just three hours away from uh three hours away from london and short distance from Cardiff are good areas for capital growth. So that's what we kind of look for in our investment criteria. So the next question is why choose BRRR? Now, when choosing BRRR as a strategy, personally, I did it because I wanted to accelerate my portfolio as quickly as possible. And I think I mentioned it before about accelerating uh, our choice in terms of our strategy, but specifically BRRR, one, I do like the renovation side of it. I do really like that. Um, if I can get an idea of getting the renovation, adding value, turning bad properties into good properties, I mean, that's that's really rewarding in itself because you're giving, one, you're giving a place for people to live, but two, you're regenerating the area as well. I make sure that we're buying the houses, particularly most of the houses that we're doing BRRR with, uh, like houses that wouldn't be habitable. So. Uh, one thing I, I run a lot of advertisements for our stuff and they're saying people can't get houses because of like property investors and all this kind of stuff my flip to that is the fact that most of these houses people would never buy I mean seriously the only people who are going to buy them are investors because they're not mortgageable in most cases which we employ the BRR strategy to so the reason that we're just really renovating the area I mean, it's a regeneration of the area and that's what we're doing that's our strategy um, and it allows us to add value pull out more capital and then keep going with less money in the deal if we don't and then once that money is out then we're able to deploy it to another investment quicker. So that's our strategy. It's just because we want to aggressively build our portfolio. Say for example, it's taking six months, then, well, it's just over really, it'll take because you'll apply for it at around that six month mark. You'll get that and you'll pull that money back out. If I'm taking a typical vanilla buy to let and it's locked up for two years, then I could buy four properties within that time if I buy, refurbish, refinance them. 
as opposed to the one and it would have all my money left in. Not really a good idea. I mean, or I could do that and buy multiple ones, but I, what I'm trying to do is accelerate the growth, keep less money in each deal, and then grow the portfolio that way. And that's the reason why we decided to do that. So the next question is, what is the best thing to invest in? Well, thinking about it, you can invest in anything you want. I'm not saying the property is the definitely the best investment. There are people who can make success of investing in lots of different asset classes, but I look at the long-term strategy of it. I want to buy properties because at the end, ultimately, one, we live in the UK, so there's a limited amount of land, and actually there's only so much being used at the moment. Very, very small percentage of the land is being used for population and residential. The other thing is that you're buying property because ultimately people need a roof over the head so that's a really important part of buying property if you look at it as an asset class it's one of the best performing asset classes in the last 20 years um that's one thing but history you know it is it, it, it isn't something that's a definite that's going to perform forever and i know and i can assess that that this isn't necessarily going to be the best thing um, forever. This is why I don't just invest in property personally. We look at other asset classes and I mean not just the same asset class. I'm not just diversifying within property or I'm not just diversifying within stocks. I divide, diversify in the asset classes that we choose. So that is stocks. We look at, we look at property. We're looking at crypto as well. We'll look at NFTs. We'll look at all other asset classes, gold and silver, other commodities. That's what you want to do is you want to be diversifying so that when the market dips in one of them, you've got still higher in the other. And that's what typically happens is when one dips, the other ones go up in some cases. So look at that overall. Um, I would say that the best strategy that you can have for investing and what's the best investment is to invest in all the different asset classes as opposed to just one. What typically happens is somebody gets really successful in one and then diversifies and that's really what we're trying to do is majority of, you, of our portfolio in terms of investments overall is in property and then our goal is to build that up and then diversify even further so that we've got something that can hold for the long term as opposed to just short-term investment. You don't just be wiped out with all your investments in property. And that's typically what you don't want to do. So look at it, if you're looking at 2008 again, 15% drop in the market instantly, that's going to hit 15% of the money that you've got. Now, what I want to do is make sure that I'm diversified across those asset classes so that it's not just happening like that. And if you look at recent statistics around gold and the increase in gold, if you would put that money uh, in most cases in gold as well, which holds a lot more value. So when since the dollar came off of the gold standard, what happened there was that really money just become virtual and is just something that's just being printed and there's no real value. Then we look at it, if you'd invested in gold, which has held this value a lot more than the, the money itself, investment in you know that strategy is to make sure that you're investing for the long term and invest in diverse asset classes and not just keeping your money in paper, I mean money, as opposed to paper assets. So yeah, ultimately, the best thing to invest in is all of them. <laughs> so when it comes to how soon to start investing, um, I would say straight away. I mean, as soon as you can possibly invest, just do it. Because that is the thing, is, is the more time that you have in the market, the better returns you're going to get over the long term. If you wait until like the very end and you wait, wait, you know, years and years and years and years, all that time, that money could have been used, could be gaining you returns. And if it's not, then you are possibly losing it. So if you look at inflation, inflation rates, are, you know, particularly high, um, not just what the Bank of England are telling you, but they're even higher than that. You're looking at probably about 5% realistically in terms of inflation rates. So when you think about that, what kind of return are you getting in the bank? I mean, you might be getting 0.1%, but it's definitely less than that when you factor in you're losing 5% on inflation. So really, I would say the best thing to do is get your money in the market, get it started straight away. And most regrettable investors, um, I was looking at a survey recently, is that they didn't start earlier and still start younger. So just start. The next question is, what is below market value? Below market value to me is below what the property would be worth. So 
if I'm looking at it, and this is pretty contentious in a way, I would say, um, but the way I look at it is uh, what would the property be like? I'm not saying like in the best standard ever, right? A lot of these below market values, because they've got something wrong with them at the end of the day, it's not below market value for the current condition. This is why I think people don't really understand is that if you've got a property that is absolutely destroyed, how can it be of market, you know, market value? I mean, if all the others are okay on the area and this one's destroyed, then the reason it's below market value is because it's destroyed, yeah? Well, the other way of looking at it is that if I've got uh, a property and I'm looking at it, you know, buying it off someone, they might think that their property is worth market value even though it's in an absolute state and it would take you money to get it up to that state and, you know, a good market value anyway. So below market value to me is usually stuff that is genuinely below what it could be at an okay standard, not the like top standard either. So uh, a lot of mistake is that people look at what it could be an absolutely excellent standard with, you know, extra extension. You want to compare like for like. So I'm looking on the street to see what is there, understand what kind of condition they're in. And I would try and get an average of that. And then I would say that it was below market value based on that. So ultimately you're looking at below market value being something of something that's probably got some sort of issue with it in most cases, or there's an issue um, that the person who's selling the property is faced. So I'll give a perfect example of this, is a property that we have purchased, and uh, the person was in financial difficulties, so they were, wanted to sell quickly, so they lowered the price of the property less than what it was worth, because they needed to pay off those debts quickly. So what we were able to do is buy it truly below market value, even though the condition was at the same standard, which I think is true below market value, buying a property that doesn't need any work um, for the same kind of standard as the other ones on the on the street, that's true below market value. But in most cases, what people consider true, uh, well, consider below market value is a property that needs a lot of work, and it would cost you that to get it up to below uh, to get it up to market value. What I want to do is make sure that I'm getting up to market value and above. What, what you would usually consider. Um, I just don't want to go for market value. I want to try and push the ceiling price in most cases um, and push the envelope so that we can pull out more money with our BRRR strategy. So if a property is unmortgageable, what do I do? That's the next question. If a property is unmortgageable, there are a couple of things you can do. Um, there's an opportunity to do exchange with delayed completion. So the opportunity there could be that you um, exchange the property, get it over to yourself legally, um, but without paying the completion fee. And then what you could do is do the work on the property to get it up to a mortgageable state to the point where you complete it and it's in mortgageable state and you get the mortgage um, going through at that point, that's a possibility if you did exchange with delayed completion or an option then on the property is another option. The other thing you could do is get the bridging finance on the property. So you could get a bridge and bridging finance won't necessarily look at the mortgageability of it. So you can get a bridging finance which will lend you um, the money that you need to purchase a property cash. And then you can look at getting the renovation done or whatever works are needed to get it into a mortgageable state. Uh, the other option then you might have is looking at lending from other sources, from other investors or something like that, using the property to purchase cash. So in most cases, if you are getting a, a property that is unmortgageable, it's likely going to have to be a cash purchase or you've got to try and find some work around, like I said earlier, um, find, for example, a lease option or exchange with delayed completion. Those are the options that you may have then to go and purchase an unmortgageable property. Kind of things can go wrong with a buy to let investment. And this, I would say, is probably a tricky question because the list is as long as my arm. Lots of things can go wrong, but ultimately lots of things go right. And the way to mitigate that is with due diligence. So making sure you've done a lot of due diligence before you've purchased the property to the point where you understand what you're getting into. So that could be doing extra things like a survey on the property and not just the home reports because they're not really worth the paper they're written on. I mean a structural survey to make sure that it's intact and even then it can't tell you everything and I've had first hand experience of that. So make sure that you understand what you're getting into. Um, best thing to do is to add 
1.5, I would say, X of what you think the renovation costs are gonna be with the property, um, just so you've got a cushion so that it doesn't completely wipe you out and you haven't got any money left. Just have a bit of a buffer so that you can make sure that you've got enough capital there if you need to, to deploy into the property to get it fixed. Um, things like that happened to us. So part of the roof blew off on a property that we had. Um, it couldn't, it couldn't, even with the structural survey, they're not getting up on the roof. They're not seeing that kind of stuff. It happens. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's something that you just need to be aware of that things can happen and can cost outside of the realm of what you originally thought. But it's something you've got to deal with. And ultimately, property is exactly the same. Even if you invest in stocks, how do you know the company's operating is, you know, properly? Like people who invested in, for example, Enron, how did they know that the people were investing correctly? Uh, you know, basically, how would you know that they were operating the company correctly? I mean, so you, you don't know 100%. You don't know if the, 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 all of those things. And if you look at the smartest guy and the guys in the room, as they were known in the, in the documentaries, that is something you want to look at. Even with stocks, you can't know everything with, with, with property, stocks, crypto, whatever it is. You can't know all of the possible unknowns. So what I would say is make sure you're just diligent um, and make sure that you're covering yourself as best as possible. Get insurance on an unoccupied property. Get insurance when um, you've got a tenant in there. Just try and mitigate as much of the damage as you can. And that's the best thing. Like when the roof came off, we had insurance, so that covered it. At least you can actually insure uh, a property as opposed to with a stock you cannot insure or crypto or any other asset like that. You're not really insuring it. So just think about it. One of the things that a benefit of investing in property is definitely that. The next question is, should I choose interest only or capital repayment mortgage? And for me, personally, it depends on a lot of factors, but I would say it would depend on your personal circumstances. So for example, if I was older, I would usually choose to do capital repayment because I want to own the properties outright when I pass away so that I can pass on to the next generation um, just for the security of that and they're not passing them a burden. Uh, but being younger, personally, I would choose a capital... Uh, in, personally, being younger, I would choose an interest-only mortgage. And the reason for that is because when you choose an interest only, what you're able to do is erode the debt over time. So with inflation, that same amount of money isn't gonna be the same in 10, 20 years from now. So if you think about it, properties double every 10 years, or historically then say. So I buy a property at 100,000. In 10 years, it doubles. So 10 years in, it's doubling as 200,000. So that 100,000 pound isn't worth what it used to be worth. So when I go and pay it down in 10 years, for example, that property isn't gonna be worth as much. So I can pay that property down quicker because the, the rest of the money has inflated in value and that money isn't worth. So 100 grand isn't 100 grand. 100 grand is gonna be worth what it was when it was 50 grand even before. So you're looking at like them doubling every, every um, yeah, every 10 years. So yeah, it would have been when it was 50 grand, went to 100, and then it's gonna keep going on and on and on. Um, the prices are increasing through, due to inflation as a reason of that. So you're gonna use that leverage to erode the debt, essentially. So that's what you're doing, is um, utilizing your interest-only mortgage to pay down um, debts that are not the same value as they were. Um, it's like paying down when you hear about houses being bought at 3,000 pound. If you'd waited and paid an interest only mortgage and then paid it, you could pay that, you know, in today's money, those people could pay that money down straight away, obviously. But like, that's the way you think about it is paying it down at that rate. So the longer you leave it, the better it could be. Um, and just because of the benefit of, of age for me personally, then I choose interest only mortgages. Next question is how to find a location. So when I'm looking at location, what I wanna make sure is that the areas are multifaceted. And what do I mean by that? I mean that I want the area to have multiple employers, not just one or two, but multiple employers, strong employers that are supporting that economy. The next thing I look at is transport links. I'll make sure that they've got good transport links to other areas and making sure they've got good internal transport links. So for when people are going to work or whatever, making sure that they are there. So ideally, if you can get buses, trains, 
you know all that kind of stuff is good or quick access to the shops and those kind of things so shops are another thing what kind of shops are in the area i'll also look on top of that crime rate making sure that it's a good area to invest in in general because those are kind of things that you want to make sure if you're investing in a bad area and your property's going to get destroyed or you know possibly burned down or something i i personally wouldn't take those kind of kind of risks and making sure that i'm buying in a good area with less crime um, particularly this is where knowing the area also really helps another thing you can do is making sure you drive around the area in the day and the evening to make sure that it's a good area because you could come and there, there could be some really bad things happening in the evening it could be dealing whatever or you know doing unscrupulous things in the evening um, that's not what you want for your investment so make sure you do check out at two different times if you can um, particularly that's what I would do just make sure that you're investing in a good area just to be safe the other thing I would check is schools make sure they got good schools in the area access to those schools and the transport links as well all of those things could be really really beneficial when choosing the right area to invest in I would say looking at definitely making sure that it's close to other capital cities as well um, but that's just for us personally because we cho choose to invest closer to Cardiff but if you were outside of London I try and make sure that the places you invest in are closer to London or closer to other key cities within in the UK um, just because if you're not investing in the city yourself making sure you're at the outskirts of those cities is a good strategy because of the ripple effect outside from those capital cities and the growth of those city or, or just key cities then say in the UK the ripple effect out of those helps the, the rest of the area around there so that's another thing I would also look at so you're probably wondering at this point why I have changed clothes well our equipment died and it was late at night and at that point I was like you know what let's get back to this in the first thing next day so I'm back doing the video and re-energized I've got my my trusty coffee with me as well so we've got some more tips coming for you right here the next question is how to find a deal now there's various ways that you can think about finding a deal if you want to go to the market that means go on the typical platforms right move zoopla on the market you can use all of those um even other lesser known platforms then uh for finding properties like gumtree you could use facebook marketplace so there's all different ways that you can do it online but the key thing is do you know how do you know when you're finding a deal the, so instead of thinking about how to find a deal I would say the other thing you need to think about is what is a deal what is your criteria maybe think about what are the returns that you need to be getting in order to make it a deal for you because a deal in my eyes might be completely different to what you see as a deal but I'll t talk about a bit more about some other platforms that you could use in order to do it so one of the things that we rely heavily on is facebook and instagram advertising so my background is actually in paid advertising for facebook and instagram so i heavily rely on that as one of our main marketing channels and it's understandable it's my background it's much easier to do something when it is your background has been something you're doing for many years Whereas many people might not consider this option because it's a whole new learning curve to understand the platforms and how to online advertise through those. So you could do that. You've got other methods. Maybe you need to troll Gumtree as another option. There's lesser deals out there, but there are some deals there. If you want to also look on Facebook Marketplace, you do find some deals there. Uh, but you have to be creative. You can put out posts into Facebook groups. There's another way of doing it. Um, putting out posts that are going to attract attention of people looking to sell quickly not as targeted unfortunately um, but it can be uh, rewarding if you are doing a high volume to get the attention of people you can go on the market like i said right move zoopla on the market all that kind of stuff but the only issue you've got is you're competing with many of the buyers at the same time so typically when i'm going for a property that is a deal uh, in my eyes anyway then i'm competing with like 10 20 other people it's it's becoming particularly hard um i've actually chatted to an estate agent friend of mine this morning and he was saying that um in the area that he is is specifically in he caters to i think there was about um seven uh properties came to market with 13 agents fighting over the same property and you and it as an investor in there as well you're fighting over exactly the same properties to get access to them so you've got to think about it okay on the market there's less and less properties coming on there there's less and less deals out there how am i going to do this for myself 
you could go direct to the vendor. This is what we advise is going direct to the vendor. So it could be through online advertising. It could be through direct to vendor strategies like physical marketing. Maybe you could do letters, maybe you could do leaflets, maybe you could do the old bandit boards as they were. Um, all other options like that could be ways of doing it. And I think what we're gonna do is do a more of a deep dive video into exactly how you can get more properties and deals and finding them the best way possible. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that in a bit more depth in another video. So the next question is, do you invest in new builds or older existing buildings? For me personally, I like to invest in older existing buildings. And the reason for that is because I can add value to those buildings. Now, if you are looking at new builds, there are opportunities out there, but typically what I'm seeing is you're not gonna get the same kind of returns as if you were going for an older building because how are you gonna add value to a property that's already brand new? It's very hard. You could go through all of that and then do the extensions and all this kind of stuff. There are ways of doing it, but it's a lot of hassle to get into something that's already uh, a new build and then start adding extensions when you'd have to start ripping things out. For example, one of the houses I was considering extension on, I would have had to rip out the kitchen and redo the kitchen at that point. And if it's an old kitchen that needs to be replaced anyway, yeah, I can understand doing something like that. But a brand new kitchen, not so much. I think that, that that's something you really gotta consider. So. Doing new builds to uh, older buildings, personally for me, um, I would rather do the older buildings um, unless, for example, I'm looking at something very long term in the future and I don't want to look at it in terms of how much money I'm making at that moment. I'm thinking quite far down the line. Then yeah, I've also heard of strategies where um, people are buying new builds um, and what they're doing is buying them when they're a bit cheaper because early on before they're built they're buying off the developer and then you get to the point where they're actually selling they've gone up in value by the time they're actually selling on the open market and then selling them at that point so there are other strategies i've heard of um, that could work and and i was talking to a friend about this the other day so there are strategies like that personally i haven't implemented something like that but it may be something that, that fits for you. Maybe you wanna um, do that. But then again, you've gotta consider other factors like how reputable is the developer that you're gonna go and use. Um, I've used so much horror stories of people uh, investing in new build developments before they've actually gone and been built. So off plan developments, uh, people losing huge amounts of money, going through legal battles, all sorts of stuff. Um, and personally, I don't want to go through that um, unless it's a trusted developer that I know myself, then I, it's not something really I'm gonna go for. And I would rather do the older buildings because I've got more scope of adding value, which is the key thing, especially when you're trying to blow buy below market value deals. It's, it's really hard to do that for a new build. So the next question I got in is, how does it feel to be nominated as one of the young property investors of the year at the Property Investor Awards? Um, I was pretty blown back by this. I never thought that I, I would be in the running whatsoever. I mean, I, I'm, I'm invested in South Wales and some of the competitors I'm going against are invested in London with developments and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, it, it, it's, it's an honor. It, it's something that I, I think, wow, you know, um, I haven't been doing it that long really in the grand scheme of things. Um, but we have been putting our effort into making sure that we're getting a lot of money back and returns on our deals and the effort is paying off, uh, it's being recognized and that. I think that's kind of the thing that um, I'm most proud of in, in that regard is that, but it, 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 it is so much of an honor. Um, and I thank obviously all of you um, and then who have supported us through it as well and wish me, um, you know, the congratulations on getting to the final. It's, it's an achievement in itself um, to get this far. So anything that happens now is a massive bonus. And, and, and I think that the idea that getting recognized as a finalist and then launching this YouTube channel is, is one thing that I've really enjoyed. So doing this and giving back and helping, I, I, that's the most rewarding thing for me at the moment. And it's the thing I'm enjoying most about what we do. So the next question is, what is the best advice I would give someone starting out in property? The best advice I would give, I would say is probably Understand what your goals are in the first place um, because this really dictates a lot of your strategy. So I always go through the fundamental things as to why I'm doing it. 
Um, if you understand why you're doing it and what are your long-term goals, then you can work your way backwards. So I'd say that was probably the, the one thing that, to me, that I wish I had spent more time doing. Although, doing it, I, I, at the very start of my journey, I, I had kind of, um, you know, what you would consider shiny object syndrome. There's lots of different opportunities within property, um, but it's understanding the strategy that you want to go for and stick into it and making that successful is probably the thing that you should look at doing. So, first of all, understand what you want from it. So, is it is it a financial goal that you want to do? Do you want to replace a job-based income? Do you want it because you're looking at the capital appreciation or do you just want the security of an asset backed? Maybe it's one of those things, um, but look deeper into it as well. Uh, I think I, I adhered to this, but ask seven whys. Um, ask why you're doing it, then ask why again, then ask why again, then ask why again. You'll get a different answer every time. Um, just so, for example, I'm doing it for my family. Why are you doing it for your family? And then ask again. So you keep going down those layers, you get to the real core of exactly why you were doing this. I learned this on a mastermind that I did um, and it's helped a lot and it helps put things in perspective and I would tell anybody to do this because it really it really does help you gain understanding of why you're doing it and it keeps you going for the long term if you understand exactly why you're doing it on an emotional level. Oh, and there is a bonus tip for that. The other thing I would, I would say is to get around people who've done it because there's lots of people out there who will share the information with you and they, they are great people to be around, especially the early stages. I would suggest networking in property events because you can get around those people who have experience. It's, it's really valuable to get around those type of people. And you can ask the questions and those are definitely the options that you can do is go into networking events, ask lots of questions, read lots of books, use free resources like this. Those are the things that I would say will help the most at the start. Um, but don't, yeah, don't get sold into spending loads and loads of money because that is one thing that you could do. You could spend all your money before you've even got into property. For example, if you spent like £25,000 on courses or anything like that before you even got a property, it's not really the best thing to do. The best experience is to do, and that's what I share in another video. So if you want to do that, check out my 11. Uh, no, it's 13. I added two more. So 13 best beginners tips for getting into a buy to let. Then um, go and check that out up here. Wait, if you have liked the video so far, please like, comment and subscribe. And let me know in the comments what has been the best tip so far. If you've got something of value from it, please let me know. Hit that like button. It helps more than you'll ever know. And it'll help us reach more people and get this video out so that it can help more people get into property. So the next question is, what is a typical return you could expect in property? Now, I would say that if you were going for it and you were looking for a solid investment where you don't have in-depth knowledge of investing in property, I would look at about 7% returns because you can do that um, quite safely. Um, but obviously, even then, getting those kind of returns is still about understanding what you're buying. You can, even at that rate, you can do things that could really be detrimental to your investment. Um, so making sure that you understand property before you go in it and having the base level understanding. Like I said, the first one is just about the learning curve. Once you've got that learning curve and you understand exactly how you're doing it, then you could look at more adventurous stuff um, and then look at making more returns. But obviously the, the higher returns usually come with higher risks. So just understand really how you're gonna maneuver that when you, when you think about the risk. Are you gonna do heavy refurbs? Are you gonna do light refurbs? Are you gonna do any refurb at all? If you're just buying something turnkey, then you don't have to do any refurb, it's already for you, and you could expect lower returns, but the lower returns, less risk. So just think about it that way. The other thing is, okay, so the other side of the returns is that you could have massive returns, and I mean, to the point where you're getting all of your money back out of the deal. And some of the videos I've shown on this channel are those uh, returns. And the reason for that is because I, I've been invested in uh, for a few years now, and I've understood exactly how to do that side of things. It's come with a lot of effort and work to be able to negotiate those deals as well. And you find how you find them is also a, a really crucial part. But those deals do exist, it, it is possible, but it's not something that you can do all the time. 
Um, and that's kind of the, the trade-off is that you're not seeing the time, effort and energy to go and find those deals. Um, so if you're looking at for something easy, then you're gonna get lower returns. But if you wanna do the harder stuff with higher returns, then it's gonna be more effort and knowledge needed in order to make those projects work. The next question is how accurate are estate agent values? Now, uh, an estate agent will typically value probably 106% of what it actually sells for. And the reason for that is because they leave a bit of wiggle room for negotiation and it's also because they're trying to win your business at the same time. So you've got to really think about these things when you're getting your property valued. I always take estate agent values with a pinch of salt and I would go as far to say as they're wildly inaccurate. Um, but some agents who I know can get it really, really well and some are probably more cynical than others and go the other way and downvalue them. But you also have to think of the estate agent motivation as to why they're doing it. Um, so really understand those aspects of it. I've had estate agents value lower because they don't want the business because the property is too complicated and things like that as well. So there are wildly varying things, but I'll give you a perfect example of this. So a property that we were doing, I had about seven agents in. And one of the reasons why is because I, I hadn't been through that process of s trying to sell a property. So I'd thought about it i went and got several agents to come around and give valuations and the valuations span massively from a hundred thousand all the way up to 140 000. so there's a massive range of of the price in the property so and these were from respectable agents um, and smaller agents and the most respectable ones were going for crazy prices then you got um, the smaller agent then would then try and get somewhere in the middle and then you've got your bargain basement agents who want to chuck it off the shelves really quickly or go a bit lower so you you see when I talk about motivations those things you need to also be wary of but yeah massive disparity between how much the property was valued at my personal view of where the property was valued at was that I thought the property originally would have been valued just under 100,000 originally. And then what happened then was over the time um, the pandemic hit and the property values um, really jumped up from there. So my valuation then was typically around 115, but still that's massively off the 140 that I was told. So just think about that when you get in valuations, make sure you've got a, a, a good data set of agents giving you valuations to get a more accurate picture but even then it really skewed things when you've got people valuing properties in silly numbers just to win the business and at the end of the day that's why I don't trust um, estate value valuations in most cases what I would do on the other hand is get a RICS surveyor to value the property um, because that's going to be the most accurate and they're the ones that are going to hold up in terms of the real valuation of the property. So a lot of people say, oh, I've had the property valued when we're trying to buy property off them. And I said, who valued it? A Rick surveyor who's, char who's chartered and is done by examination or someone who's an estate agent. Now I'm not saying that one is def definitely better than the other, but one has gone through a rigorous process and has really high standards that they have to adhere to in order to be chartered surveyor. Whereas the other one doesn't necessarily need any of that, that background. So I, I would trust the, the charter surveyor in most cases as opposed to just going on a, a state agent value. So Rick surveyor is the one that's going to hold up and that's the one the mortgage companies use. So that's the most accurate one for me. So I'd always go for that if you've got the option. Next question is what are my thoughts on holiday let or service accommodation? Now I think it's something that could be a really interesting strategy. Um, but you do have to understand that there is work involved. So typically your vanilla buy to lets and even the buy refurbish refinance once it's done and it's rented out are gonna be a lot lower maintenance. Whereas your short term lets are then gonna be a lot more time intensive but there is higher yields because you can get a lot more returns. So I've heard some silly numbers go around of people earning really high uh, levels of money for uh, just a week's stay. But when you think about that, there is work involved and it's about the time commitment to doing it. I think it's something that we wanna try in the future, 
but it's going to be at a time where we test and we really look at it and then test if we're going to do it as a full-time thing but i don't think that all all of our strategies is going to be that but we're going to look at it more intensely um and really go into that that field but at that point it's going to be a decision where we do lots of um service accommodation at the time not just one i was on a another uh training where i was on a mastermind where we talked about this and, and, and had, had ideas on whether this would be a good idea and really if you're going to do it just for one i don't really see the benefit of it um because it's just going to be a hassle because you haven't got the economies of scale so you you need to build systems and everything like that to make it a scalable business and to be as hands-free as possible um but there's always going to be something you're going to do because at the end of the day it, it is a business in itself but if you are going to do it i would look at how you're going to do not just one but multiple to make sure that you're maximizing your time effort and returns the next question is on about growing the team so who do you need in your team is more more importantly i think that that than just growing anybody in your team so typically you're going to need a solicitor you're going to need your builder contractor you're going to need your broker so your mortgage broker those are kind of the key core people that you're going to need you might need a structural surveyor if you're doing things that are a bit more out there um where it's just going to need the heavier works but some people decide to get structural surveys on everything so personally i i i don't because um it's not always necessary and it can be costly to do so um especially in the early days but if it's something that i look at and and maybe it needs the the work or i'm unsure on i'll get a structural survey so those are kind of people but the contractors that's a whole list in itself so you're going to need your plasterer you're going to need your rip out team you're going to need the electrician your gas engineer you're going to need loads of people involved with that side of things so those are the probably crucial parts of your investment and making sure that the renovations go and probably one of the most costly parts of any uh property investment is definitely the renovation unless you're doing little tiny bits and pieces but most cases if you're going into property investment you're looking below market value deals and typically those deals are going to need a bit of work done to them so yeah i'd, I'd say making sure you got those people in place is absolutely crucial the best way to go about growing those teams i would network with them and get to know them that is the best way that i found to do it because essentially what you want to do is is be networking with the people that you're going to see every week um so i'm actually a member of bni so the reason for that is because if i go to bni i'm going to see those exact same people every week and i know that the the job is going to get done whereas if you use other people um it, it can be a bit of a hassle because you don't know if they're going to be reliable or not and there's, there's i'm not saying that every every time that you go to a network and you're going to use those people i found other people outside of that who've been very reliable but recommendation from people who genuinely use them is probably the best option that i i would suggest um but genuinely have used them a lot of people will put somebody on social media just because they've heard of them and they've got a bit of a brand but you want to know who's used them directly their experience with them get to chat to those people because when you're putting a lot of money into a renovation it's not something you want to really cut corners on uh just as much as you have to do due diligence on the property before you buy it you need to do due diligence on the people who are going to work on it as well and that includes your solicitor includes your broker get to know other people who have used them before because that's going to be the most accurate picture of whether they're going to be good or not for you the next question is how do you build relationships with estate agents i built relationships with estate agents by basically going on lots of viewings um the way that you do it is you're going to see the same people over and over again if you go on lots of viewings and at the end of the day you know they have got their little black book and they've got investors in their pocket that they use over and over again the reason they're going to go for you over someone else is they can see you're trying hard and you're building some sort of relationship being interested in them um talking about property because a lot of these people are quite interested the best people to talk to in an estate agency are usually either the people who are hungry and want want to get into property themselves which is a great one um somebody interested in investing themselves is definitely a good one or 
if you were looking directly to the owner of the estate agency, those are great people to chat to. They're gonna be more into the business than, than anybody else in the company. Um, those are good people to chat to and those are gonna be the best people to know. So those are, those are definitely the best ways of doing it is to go on lots of viewings, build some sort of relationship, talk about commonalities, find something that you've got in common. Even if it's not property, maybe it's football, something like that. Have some commonal commonality with them, um, and then just build up the relationship naturally from there. That is the best way of doing it. But ultimately, I'd say that giving business is one of the best ways. So if you've got an estate agent who's also got a letting agent, if you buy a property from them, that's gonna be a good way that's gonna boost you up in their rankings because you bought something from them. If you then let with them, then they've got a, a reason to be in touch with you. So you're giving them money monthly to manage the property. Um, and that is a good way of have building some sort of relationship because you're giving back into them or selling through them as another option. So if you buy the property through them, you go to them and you say, right, okay, well, what, what we're thinking of doing is once we um, buy the property, we're gonna sell it back through you because you've done such a good job of selling the property to us in the first place. We'll buy it and we'll do it up and then we'll sell it back to you, uh, through you uh, after the renovation. So if you're looking at flips, that's a good strategy and then they'd be more inclined to give it because they're gonna get double fees, one from whoever selling the property and then one from you selling the property again. So look at ways that it's gonna be beneficial for them to work with you over anyone else and that's definitely the best way to build relationships. So the next question is, what is a motivated seller? If you're looking at this um, from another perspective, a motivated seller is breaking it down from the two keywords involved in, in the sentence. So motivated and seller. So you need a motivation. What is the motivation behind selling the property in the first place? Now, if you are going to sell a property, there's many reasons as to why you're going to sell. But typically, somebody who's motivated is in a hard position. So it could be somebody has passed away and it's a probate property. It could be that they're going through financial distress. It could be divorce. It could be relocation and they need to sell the property quickly because they're moving away. There's lots of different factors as to why somebody needs to sell. Um, but motivated sellers are usually people who need to sell fast. So that is one thing that you need to understand with a motivated seller. And one of the things that helps with that is that typically when you're getting to motivated sellers, these are people who are gonna be selling the property cheaper in order to shift it as quickly as possible. Or there's complications around it. Maybe there's loads of work that needed on the property. That's another reason as to why they'd be motivated. Costs are piling up, they're paying out of the nose to it. There is your motivation right there. So lots of different motivations as to why someone would need to sell um, and that's why they usually typically need to sell quickly. Next question is, what are the pros and cons of property investing? Specifically, I, the, the, the one that first stands out to me is that in order to invest in property, first of all, the con is that you have to have um, some sort of capital, even if it's not your own, and it's usually a substantial amount. So even if you're buying it with a mortgage, it's usually 25% on a buy-to-let mortgage. So 25% deposit at the purchase price. That's quite, in usually quite significant amounts. Um, whereas you could get started with stocks with just a couple of pound in, in your pocket, that type of thing. So those things you need to, you need to really understand is that it's going to take you time before you get into investing because either you've got the money there to deploy or you've got to save for the money or you've got to get other people's money to use. So just think about it that way. It is bigger money that you're investing, but you've obviously got the key benefit then is leverage. So in other investments, you don't have this, uh, amazing, then thing called leverage. So leverage is basically what I just chatted about is that putting 25% deposit down for 100% um, of the investment. So you're putting in less in, but you are getting it back then by uh, the mortgage company to give you and lend you the rest of the money to go and purchase an asset. Whereas if I said that to do that with stocks, they wouldn't let you do that. So there is a massive benefit there. You can have less and own a bigger asset. So for example, if you have um, properties going up at 5% a year, say. So properties typically, if they're capital appreciation, they're doubling every 10 years, quadrupling every four, obviously. So it's a massive increase, but obviously you have to think about inflation with that, which I'll do another topic on that. But let's say they're going up 5% a year. So the property is 100, 100 grand and it's gone up 5%. That's going to go up 5 grand. So you think about it like that. If you were doing it on a, a 
stock, you have that value of the stock, but you're buying it at that value. So you're not leveraging it. So when it goes up, if you've got a stock that's say in 25 grand, then if that goes up 5%, it's going to be 5% of 25 grand as opposed to 5% of 100 grand. So there is a massive difference um, between the two and you just need to understand when you're investing, there's a massive benefit with that. Um, I, I think I'll go through some of the pros and cons then a bit more, but we'll be your whole day for that. And I think a separate video would be a great place to do the pros and cons of property investing. I hope you enjoyed this q and I've gone through lots and lots of different things um, that you could use in your property journey. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, if you could please like, subscribe and comment and hit the notification bell. Uh, let me know what has been the best tip that you've got from today's Q&A. Uh, it has been something that I've wanted to do for quite a while with the Q&As and I've got quick fired questions. So these are off the top of my head and I think that there's lots of inspirational videos that we could do off the back of this. So so if it's a question that you've got further, let, them, let me know in the comments and I'll add it into the next Q&A. Otherwise, I'll even think of doing some of these in specific videos. So if you have questions, I could do a whole video on them. So just drop the comment below and I'll see you in the next video.